Just start whenever. Okay. <clears throat> All right, can you guys hear me? Is this thing working well enough? Okay, so um, in today's lecture, we're gonna take uh, yet a third approach to thinking about doing, doing theory in, in biology. So just to recap, in the first lecture, I gave you little toy models that either were informed by something that, you, that we think we know about biochemistry or posited a, a, a toy model and then studied what the, what the model does, how it performs, um, and you know, how expensive it is to, to, to run it. In, uh, but it was really a study of, of, of toy models. In the second lecture, we tried to put the data first and, uh, take a, and, and look and see what the, what the data seems to tell us if we use the lens of a physicist. So, if anyone tells you th that they're letting the data speak for themselves, it, it doesn't make sense. Don't believe them. So we, we were doing our best to do that, but through the lens of a physicist. Um, and we didn't, we didn't posit anything uh, about what the, the, what the data would tell us or what it was trying to do. We just tried to use the language of physics and, and some models that are in inspired by physics to fit. Um, in this third lecture, we're actually going to uh, make a, a hypothesis about what, uh, what a biological system is doing, uh, but we're going to do it not at the level of making a toy model and then studying the toy model. It's going to be a sort of big picture. Think of it like a least action kind of principle, and then we're going to look and see what that implies for uh, a particular system. And uh, the, co the, the kind of sort of big picture uh, uh, idea that we're going to use is going to be in the uh, in the general framework of of optimiza opt optimization and optimality. Um, the the reason for this is that all the systems that you study when you think about biology got here uh, not in the way that a material in a condensed matter physics lab got there, which might just be you found it somewhere and you and you started measuring it, but it, it got here via uh, a long process of evolution. And maybe it's controversial to say this more precisely, but in some sense, evolution is working towards optimizing something in the sense that um, you often think about a notion of fitness, which is related to how well you can survive and reproduce and stuff like that. And if you can do those things better, then you will make more babies, and then there'll be more of you, and you'll win the evolution game, right? So there's, there's some sense in which uh, <clears throat> things that you see that arose from evolution um, are trying to be better than other things. Uh, evolution has been going on for a long time, we think, um, uh, on, you know, on this planet, but it's not really clear um, how easy or hard the problem is that evolution is trying to solve. In some sense, it's not clear the algorithm it's trying to use. Um, the environment that, uh, that organisms are living in is changing, uh, both due to the environment itself changing, but also the organisms that other organisms are competing with are changing constantly. So, so you shouldn't think that um, because something arose via evolution, it is definitely guaranteed to be optimized. That's one thing. So w it's a continual process. Um, people study uh, theoretical uh, evolution, uh, try to connect it to data, and basic questions about how long it takes to evolve certain things um, are really unclear uh, to the extent that we don't even have like log-log accuracy with some things. Um, you know, so if, if you ask a, a you know, someone, you know, oh, we, we made a mistake and uh, the Earth is actually 10 times older than we thought it is, then should, should we be surprised that the, at the, like, poor level of, of complexity of us organisms on Earth or not? Um, we don't really have any way to say that. So we, so we don't really have accuracy, even at 
a logarithmic, logarithmic scale of, of time scales or population sizes, or in some sense, in, in some ways, even log log scales. So um, I don't want you to think that just because something arose from evolution, it is optimized. But I think it is safe to say that evolution is working towards optimizing things. So thinking about optimality principles can be useful. And um, there can be certain things like, uh, like the eye, which is what, what I'll talk about, that have been around for a long time. And uh, there are a lot of similarities between your eye and a monkey's eye and a mouse's eye and a salamander's eye. There are a lot of differences as well. There are a ton of differences. But there might be some uh, underlying similarities. Um, another thing worth, worth thinking about when you want to posit some sort of optimality principle and derive its consequences is you can't just say optimize this. You have to say optimize this subject to some resources or, or some costs, some constraints. So the flavor of the sort of optimality that we're going to be talking about is going to be of that form where there's the thing that you would like to have be as good as possible, but there's a budget in some sense. And we're going to have to see what happens as, as we trade off uh, doing, doing better versus paying the cost of, of doing that. So that, that's, that's the flavor. Um, the, um, the, there, there are many different sort of optimality <laughs> principles that people, that people think about. I'm going to talk about one that comes uh, from information theory. It's in some sense very abstract, uh, but it also gives me a chance to introduce to you uh, some basics of information theory. Um, so, so last time we talked about, uh, about entropy, and uh, we talked about it mainly in the thermodynamic sense, but I introduced it as a sort of information theoretic quantity. Uh, one, one interpretation that I, I didn't give you but is, is maybe useful is that uh, imagine you have a, a long sequence of bits, say zeros and ones, but maybe there are a lot more zeros than there are ones. Um, and you would like to take this, these long sequences and uh, compress them down in a lossless way. You don't want to lose uh, information as you do it. You want to be able to reconstruct exactly. Um, it turns out that um, you can take this long string and compress it down to an, a, a much shorter length, potentially, where the, uh, the, the average or the, the, the length uh, of, the, of the code that you need when you compress it is basically the entropy of that distribution. That's one way of thinking about it. So in some sense, the entropy is a measure of the resources that you need to represent a distribution. Okay. Um, it also can be confusing when you're first learning about these things, the distinction between thermodynamic and information theoretic entropy. There really isn't any. And there's a, a I think, apocryphal story that when Claude Shannon was uh, inventing information theory, he, he went to von Neumann to ask, uh, what should I call this quantity? And von Neumann said, you should call it entropy for two reasons. First of all, we already have a quantity like this in, th in thermodynamics, and it's called entropy. Secondly, uh, nobody understands entropy, so you'll have the upper hand in any argument. Um, I don't know whether this is true or not. So OK, um, but what I want to talk about today is, uh, is mutual information, which is a measure of dependency between different variables. And uh, to do that, I need to introduce to you a couple of different kinds of entropies that you're probably familiar with, depending on, on your background. But uh, just to make sure, um, let, me, let me just introduce a couple of them. So um, first, we want to define the conditional entropy. And this, uh, so last time when I wrote entropy, I used S. Um, I'm going to use H here because in the different literatures and in, in physics it's called S and information theory is called H. And they're the same thing. So uh, we're talking about information theory, so I'm going to use H. Um, so the conditional entropy of a variable Y given another variable is going to be an average with respect to the variable X of the entropy of the conditional distribution of y given x.
So first of all, just to make sure, are people familiar uh, and comfortable with the notion of a conditional distribution? If you have y given x, that's totally fine. Um, so this is, I told you what x is. There's still some, uh, maybe x and y are, are related to each other in some way. So this tells me something about y, but there's still a, a distribution of y's left over. And there's an entropy uh, associated with that. And um, this is for a fixed value of, uh, of x. So what I really want to do is I want to average that um, with respect to the distribution of x. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to add that in. <laughs> Good. OK. Um, so, so this is one quantity that is going to show up a lot. Uh, so hopefully it is uh, it's intuitive. Is this OK? Um, The next one is called the relative entropy. And I'm not going to use that term. I'm going to use another one, um, which is named after people, Kolbach Leibler, divergence. And this is the name that is more commonly used in the literature, so um, I probably should be calling it the Kale divergence or relative entropy. So this is, this is the, the dominant one. And in fact, the notation is such that it's called the divergence uh, of KL, and it's between two distributions. And we take P, and we're going to uh, we're going to average, with respect to p, the log ratio of p to q. Uh, before I go further, I, I should emphasize, I'm just writing log here. And uh, if you want, you could put this log base 2, and then everything is measured in bits. If you put it natural log, everything is measured in, in nats. Um, I'm just going to write log, and then it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so what is this quantity? This is supposed to be a, a measure of the, the distance between two probability distributions. Um, so you can see that when, when P and Q are equal to each other, uh, you get a log of 1, so, so this is going to be 0. So, okay, good. When the distributions are equal, it's 0. It turns out that that's the only way for this to be 0, when the two distributions are exactly the same. Um, so it's bounded below by 0. Um, but it can be infinite. Uh, if, for example, you have uh, a value of x for which p is not 0, but q is 0, then this is going to be infinite, right? So this, 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 uh, this divergence varies from 0 to infinity. So it's not easy to say, oh, the, the KL divergence between these two distributions is, is 16 bits. What does that mean? I don't know, because it, it's unbounded from above. OK. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that this quantity is not symmetric with respect to P and Q, right? Um, so it matters that I put P here and Q here. Um, you might not like that. There are other, other divergence measures that, that symmetrize this, one called the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Uh, there are other things, but this is the one that's, that's relevant for us uh, today. Um, so, um, let's see. The, re the reason it's relevant for us is that uh, what I want to talk about is mutual information. And you can think about mutual information as related to this kind of, uh, of KL divergence. Uh, and it's a very particular kind of KL divergence. And it's between. Uh, Let's see. So imagine I have a joint distribution uh, of two variables, x and y. Um, I can sum over, uh, over y, say. And that gives me the distribution just of x. Okay? And I can do that for, for y as well. So if I allow for that, um,
we can define the mutual information. Um, between two variables, x and y, in a bunch of different ways. The first is like this. Um, so we're going to average with respect to the full joint distribution of x and y, the log ratio of the joint distribution of x and y divided by uh, the product of the marginals of x and y. Okay? So from the definition I just wrote down over there, this is equal to the KL divergence between the joint distribution and this product of marginals. The reason this is a useful way to think about it is that this joint distribution could have all sorts of complicated correlations between x and y. This product of the marginals distribution, by definition, has nothing, right? You have x sitting there and you have y sitting there next to each other, but you've broken any, any relationship between them. And if, if this is some reasonable measure of the distance between two distributions, then this is telling you how far away your true joint distribution uh, of x and y is from one where there's actually no connection between the two. Okay. Um, so this is one way of writing it. There's three other ways um, that are useful. One is, uh, which way should I go first? Um, as a difference of two entropies. The first is just the entropy of this marginal distribution of x. And the second is the conditional entropy of x given y. Uh, I guess I'd put y given x over here. But um, the idea here is there's some uncertainty in x. And then if, if I measure y, this conditional entropy tells me how much uncertainty remains and the difference between those two. Um, is telling me something about how much I learn when I, I measure y uh, about x. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it's just the, the entropy of, of this distribution. Does that make sense? Oh, no, it, it is that. So, so imagine I have this joint distribution. I sum out y. I get a p of x. And then, I, and then from this, I do uh, minus sum over x uh, of, of this. So if you want, I could do sum over y of p of x comma y uh, log of this. So that'd be sum over y of p of x, y. So in terms of the the joint distribution, this would be the, the entropy of just, just x. Does that make sense? Um, OK. Uh, it turns out that mutual information is actually symmetric. This quantity is not symmetric. But the mutual information between x and y is. The KL divergence is not, but here x and y enter symmetrically. So if I can write it like this, I should be able to write it also like this. So it's also the reduction in uncertainty I have about y when I measure x, just as it is the direction, reduction in uncertainty about x when I measure y. And yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, so yeah, so so h of x it, like from last time is um uh is this it, it's just it's just the same as as our s 
of x from, from last class. Um, I was trying to write that out more complicated here by giving you the, the, the version of, of p of x that, that we have from the joint distribution. <laughs> That's all that that is. OK. Um, the last uh, way of writing it that is useful um, that maybe we'll come back to is um, the entropy of x plus the entropy of y minus the entropy of xy, which again, I didn't really define for you. But what I mean by the entropy of xy is the entropy of uh, the joint distribution. So. And this says, well, if, if x and y are related to each other in some way, yeah. Uh, you need, so to do any of this, someone needs to hand you a p of x, x comma y. Um, otherwise, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you would do. OK, so um, the interpretation here would be that um, if x and y have some, some relationship to each other, they're correlated in some way, the entropy of the full joint distribution is not, uh, is not uh, as big as it could be. So if you, if you compare the size of this to the size of the entropy of x and the entropy of y sort of independently, um, it might be smaller as a result. So that, that reduction in entropy means that there's information uh, between the two. This is all interpretations. These, you, can, you can manipulate this original equation into all of these forms if you want. I'm just trying to give you some way of, uh, uh, of understanding what, what the meaning of these different forms is. Um, so, so why might you want to, uh, to think about information? In physics, we usually think about, about correlations, right? Uh, connected correlations. Oh, yeah. Uh, for the relative entropy? Um, so the motivation for it. Um, I don't have the greatest motivation for it. Uh, I can just tell you that it's a, it's a measure that is zero if and only if p equals q. Uh, and it's bigger than zero when p does not equal q. And it's unbounded from above. Um, Um, it has some connections to free energies and stuff like that, but I think I'll, I, I'll save that. Um, okay. So, um, in physics, we usually think about correlations. We think about pairwise correlations between, uh, different variables in our system. Uh, sometimes you, you have higher order correlations that, that you're, you're working with as well. Um, but you're, you're usually looking at, at different orders of, of correlation, uh, usually low orders. And mutual information is a way of uh, combining all different orders of correlation together into one measure um, that captures all, all possible dependencies between, between variables. Um, so sort of a, a canonical example of, of a distribution that uh, has no pairwise correlation but has information is imagine you have variable x and a variable y and it has you have a, a density uh, where it's sort of on a ring or something like this um, then there's there's no no second order correlation between between x and y but um, if you if you measure x and you say x is is here then you know something uh, about y or you, you measure x to be zero you know y is either here or here um, so there, there, there is information. There are dependencies between these variables, uh, but they're not represented by the kind of correlation that you would, you would study in physics. Um, so in general, if you don't know what kind of, of correlation you're looking for, information is a good quantity. OK. Um, the, the original motivation for where this, this quantity comes from uh, and why Shannon invented it comes from uh, something called channel coding, and uh, 
like we talked about entropy arising from the uh the minimal length of uh of code words that we you would use to compress uh a, a redundant sort of sequence of bits um mutual information comes from thinking about transmitting information across a noisy channel and how big that channel has to be um so i'm i don't want to go down that that route i just want you to keep in mind that in some ways uh, information is related to the, the cost of communication. Okay. So that's all I wanted to tell you about the basic definitions of, of uh, quantities in information theory. Now I wanted to give you a, an information theoretic optimization principle. <laughs> we'll think about it, and then we'll apply it uh, to, to some, or at least I'll tell you what happens when you apply it to, to a biological system. Um, so the thing that I want to think about is called the information bottleneck. And... Um, I think it was 1999. Um, this is uh, the the senior author on this is is again Bill Bialik uh, at Princeton who uh, did the maximum entry stuff from yesterday. Um, this is a framework for doing uh, lossy compression uh, that, when it was uh, first invented, was wildly popular. It sort of uh, fell by the wayside for a couple of years, and now it's making uh, a rise again. So I think it's a very timely time to, to know about these things. So the idea is uh, we want to imagine a system that takes uh, input from some variable, uh, but that, that input is maybe uh, high dimensional, and only some aspects of it are useful. Maybe that, that variable is correlated with another thing that we care about, and we would like to, to get rid of uh, as much of the stuff in the input as possible, uh, because if you're a biological system, it's, it's expensive to be coding things and representing things if you don't need them. Um, so uh, let's, let's think about this in general. So let's imagine that you have an input variable x, and it's correlated to some variable y. So again, someone hands you a joint distribution between x and y. And we, want, we, we don't get to look at, at y directly. y is, is something that is related to x, we, but we only get x as the input. And we want to make some uh, compression or representation of x uh, in such a way that we know as much as we possibly can about y without having direct access to it. Okay. Um, so we want so so the the problem is handed to us in in terms of a joint distribution p of x and y we want to find a q uh, of t given x a conditional distribution an encoding distribution and in general uh distributions that are given to me in the problem setup i'll call p distributions that we get to choose i'll call q so this is going to be a, a something that we vary um and what we want to do is we want to find Q um, by solving the following optimization problem. We want to minimize with respect to Q um, this functional. which is the mutual information between x and t minus some parameter times the mutual information between y and t. So um, there are two terms here. The first term is the mutual information that our encoding has about the input. And we're saying we want to minimize this quantity, right? And this says that we would like to not encode things about x if possible. We would like to throw them away. Um, 
And one motivation for this is that if you, if you imagine a channel between X and T being expensive, then uh, we would like to make that channel as small as possible. And if, if the mutual information is very small, then we don't need uh, much in the way of communication between X and T. But the whole point of the game is not just to throw things away. If, if, we, if that was it, we would just say T equals zero always or something. Uh, what we want to do is make T be informative about Y. So we put a minus sign, and we have the information that T has about Y. Um, and I don't really know how to say how much you should, you should have, you should do a good job at representing Y versus how much you should be throwing away things about the input. So I'm going to put some trade-off parameter here. And then you can change the trade-off parameter and see what happens as you change the trade-off parameter. Does that make sense? Um, uh, so you can, you can so, so to solve this, um, th this, this i is a function, uh, functional of, uh, of q, as is this, this, this information. Um, so if you wanted to solve this, um, you would add uh, a Lagrange multiplier term that looks like this. Um, so you need some Lagrange multiplier that enforces the, the normalization of, uh, of the conditional distribution for every value of x. So the Lagrange multiplier is a function of x. And um, you, know, you would add that here. And then you would take the, the variational derivative of, uh, of this quantity with respect to Q, set it equal to zero, and do some manipulations that I'm not going to do for you here. Um, um, so then you would take, you would vary L with respect to Q, and set it equal to zero. Um, and there, uh, a couple of things that you can you could notice that are are important. There are various quantities that that show up in here. There's, for example, the entropy of t itself, um, and that's written in terms of t given x and things like that. So there there are certain kinds of things that are are easy to see based on the structure of the problem here. But I'll, I'll write them down anyway. Um, You look at how q of t given y, which is another thing that is going to be implicitly defined from this. If you look at how that changes with respect to changing this, um, that is equal to p of x given y, it turns out. And the way the marginal distribution of t changes when I change uh, my encoding is just going to be p of x. And again, this all just comes from the structure of the model, uh, so the structure of the problem. So for example, this one comes from saying that, that q of t equals a sum over x of uh, p of x, q of t given x, right? So if I take the derivative respect to, to this, I just get p of x back. So this one you get similarly. Um, so Using you know, these kinds of identities, you take the functional derivative of this with respect to the encoding, set it equal to zero, and you get some equations that I'll, I'll write down for you. So what you end up getting is a set of two coupled equations. Sort of three, but.
um, you get some, some equations. So this is the thing we want, the encoding Q of T given X. Um, and we have a solution for it, but it's in terms of uh, Q of Y given T, the conditional distribution of the output given our, com our compression T. And that we don't know. And that itself is defined implicitly in terms of the encoding itself. Um, so you end up with these, these coupled equations. And to solve them, you just start somewhere. And then you update this one. And then you update this one. And then you update this one. And you keep going until uh, things stop. Uh, this is something called the blahut arimoto algorithm. And it's, you can prove that it's guaranteed to, to converge. Um, the problem is non-convex, so it might converge to a local optimum, not a global optimum, but it'll at least converge eventually. Um, so the, the MIDI equation is the first one. The second one is essentially just talking about this, the sort of uh, conditional independence properties of the, of the problem. So if I bring this up here, um, the, then the left-hand side is just the joint distribution between Y and T. Um, and the joint distribution between Y and T uh, ends up building all of its correlations indirectly via X. So what we should do is we should marginalize out X, um, and then we have the joint distribution of X and Y, and then the conditional distribution of T given X. So this is just rewriting the problem. We haven't, there's nothing there. Um, the interesting one is, uh, is this one here, where as we update, um, if you think about T being... Uh, discrete, for example, w when we do a new update, we send t's uh, to values where uh, here we have an exponent with a minus sign of the KL divergence between two, two distributions. One of them is the distribution of y given the, ho the whole input, and one is the distribution of y given the, the compression. So if these things say similar things, uh, then we send t's to, uh, to those kinds of clusters. Maybe that's not a useful way of saying it, but whatever. Um, it's possible to, to interpret this. And, and the, uh, the, the beta parameter here uh, shows up here in the exponent and controls how strongly uh, you want to do that. Um, does this make some sense? You believe me that you can go from, from here, five, six lines of algebra to, to here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, Z is the normalization. You can think of it as a partition function. Uh, I actually didn't even write it down here. You can, you can imagine what it is by making sure that this is normalized, basically. Um, OK, so uh, this, is, this is what you get if, uh, if someone tells you what you should use for beta. Yeah. Uh, Q of T, uh, this one here. Uh, this this is uh, 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 it's de determined if if uh, if I tell you the Q of T given X, um, then Q of T is determined by uh, starting with with an X, looking at Q of T given X, and then integrating over X. Does that make sense? That, that's all that this says. This is just. Uh, Sort of the rules of probability telling me how the distribution of t will will look if I know the encoding and I know the the distribution of x. The questions. So nobody tells me necessarily what the, what the value of this this trade-off parameter is. So it's useful to think about. Um, what the structure of the solutions look like as we parametrically vary that parameter. So if you do that, um, you can look in what's called the information plane, these problems. You can look at the, the mutual information between x and t, and the mutual information between uh, y and t. Uh, and as we vary beta, that will trace out a curve for uh, what this opti optimum looks like. And uh, maybe it looks something, something like this. Um, 
and this should eventually approach the mutual information between x and y itself, right? You can't possibly uh, have more information within y your, your compression t uh, about y than x did. Uh, this is called the data processing inequality. Um, and it's, it should be intuitively true, but it's also true. You can't create more information. Um, and the idea here is that, that this curve that, that you trace out, uh, parameterized by beta, separates the plane into two regions. Uh, up here is inaccessible. It's not possible to find some uh, encoding Q of T given X that sits here. If you only have such and such amount of information about X, the most you could possibly have about Y is this much. And if someone tells you that they're up here, they're lying to you, right? Um, it's possible, possible to be anywhere down here. You, you could find encodings that live anywhere, um, but it's, it makes sense that if you want to be as efficient as possible, if you're gonna, if you're gonna make the effort to, to keep track of this many bits of information about the input, um, or this many bits of information about the input, uh, then rather than, than only having this much about the thing you care about, you should try to find the one that has this much. So this is a, a better representation in a sense. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, that's the, the framework of the information bottleneck. Now what I want to do is, is tell you a little bit about uh, uh, work that people have done trying to apply it to, uh, to neurobiological neurobio data. Um, so, so last time we talked about uh, this neural population uh, activity and modeling a distribution and so on, and I want to go back to that same uh, kind of idea. Imagine you, you have a neural population, in this case, same as yesterday, uh, neurons that are in the retina of some animal that is watching a movie, and we're going to look at how the, uh, the neural population is uh, encoding uh, the movie. Um, so we're going we're gonna to think of, of the movie as somehow related to X and Y, but we need to think carefully about what we, what, what we want to do because mutual informations are difficult to compute uh, and we need some form for the structure of the, of, the, of the movie such that we can actually think about these quantities. So what, um, what uh, was done, and this is a, a, a PNAS paper, um, from 2015. Uh, and what they studied was something called predictive information. Um, and the idea here is to say that x, the thing that our neural population is going to take as input, well, I believe in causality, so this should be the past stimulus. Um, everything that I do in my life, because if I, if I want to move my arm, and I think I want to move my arm, and then I move my arm, there's, I don't know, 100 to 200 millisecond delay between doing that. So everything that I'm doing involves acting in the future. Uh, beyond when I, when I want to do it. So it makes sense that the only possible relevant stuff is the future. So let's think about why is the future of the stimulus. So for example, if you want to catch a ball or you know, hit, you know, hit a tennis ball with a racket, um, you need to be anticipating where the thing is going to be because in the, in the few hundred milliseconds that it takes you to act, if the ball's moving fast, it has moved. So you have to make it you have to anticipate, oh, I, I don't want to go swing where I, where I see it right now. I want to swing where it's, where it's going to be. So I should be trying to 
get information about where the thing will be. Um, and then the, the, com the compression itself will, will be the neural activity. Okay. Um, so what what they did is they they didn't want to just use a movie of uh, I don't know some action movie that you know blockbuster that they show because that's too difficult to actually try and compete with. So they made their own movie that was pretty simple, uh, but had aspects of it that are uh, are useful for predicting the future state of the movie and other aspects that are not useful. So just to be concrete, I'll write that down. So what they did is they, they made a movie that had a bar that was moving back and forth and the equations of motion for the bar uh, were the simplest possible thing you could imagine. So... Um, You have a mass with a spring and a little bit of damping. Um, and this aspect of, uh, of the dynamics is predictable. Um, and then you add a little bit of, of uh, Gaussian white noise that is not predictable. So you can, uh, you can imagine this bar jiggling back and forth. It's tethered to, to the middle by a spring. Um, it gets kicked around, and it has some, some damping. Um, and if, if this is a Gaussian white noise, then in, s in steady state, the, the distribution of x and the distribution of v will also be Gaussian. So there's some sort of overall distribution of p of uh, x and v that is some, some Gaussian distribution. Um, and you could imagine a, a neural population that, uh, that keeps track of various aspects of uh, of, of X and V. So imagine uh, imagine you know that the, the bar is somewhere with a value of X in this range and a value of V in this range. Um, and then uh, imagine evolving that forward in time. So you have a bunch of samples of this. And then they evolve forward in time, and, and they eventually, over long times, come back to this sort of prior distribution of just what the, th what the thing is doing. Or imagine that you know um, the velocity with relatively high fidelity, but you don't know x very much. And you imagine having a bunch of samples here and letting those evolve back to the prior. Or vice versa, knowing x very well, but not knowing v, and, and letting all those evolve back to the prior. Different ways of of knowing things about the dis about what x and v are doing right now will be useful for predicting where what what the bar is doing at some time delta t in the future um and this sort of information that you have about the joint distribution of x and v is related to sort of the area of these things so i could have different uh different blobs that have the same area so i have the same amount of information about X and X and V, but s but depending on the parameters uh, here, maybe measuring position is is really useful, or maybe measuring velocity is really useful, and so different ways of having the same number of bits of information about the, st the state of the system are more or less useful for for predicting the, the state a certain time in the future. So even like the most trivial problem you can possibly think about. Um, provides a non-trivial distinction between the kinds of information that you should have uh, if you want to be able to predict the future state of the stimulus. Does that make sense? Um, so essentially what they did was they, they made a movie of this, um, and uh, because of the, of the simplicity of the stimulus, it's possible to, not just through this uh, iterative algorithm that I wrote down, but actually analytically, you can compute the optimal information bottleneck uh, objective uh, 
for this kind of problem. It's like basically the only case of analytic tractability I know of when things are jointly Gaussian. Uh, it's still actually quite difficult, um, but it can be done uh, with like 30 pages of algebra. Um, and, you, and you get some curve like this, and then you can look at the neural responses and measure the information that the neurons have uh, about the past uh, of x and v and about the future, a uh, certain time delta t into the future uh, about x and v, um, and look at where, where, the d where the different neurons sort of live on this kind of plot. Does that make sense? Um, and this is, a, this is a population, so they had, uh, they looked at single neurons and looked at what, what did single neurons do. They looked at groups of two neurons, groups of three neurons, groups of four neurons. Um, and at some point, they can't uh, sort of sample the, uh, the distributions well enough to estimate the information. So I think they got up to like seven or groups of seven or eight neurons or something like that. And what they found was that the, um, and this is schematic, this is not the scale at all. Um, the individual neurons sit somewhere down here. Uh, the groups of two neurons sit somewhere here. Three neurons sit somewhere here. Four, here, five, and so on. So, um, size one, two, three, four, five, six. So the, I the idea is that as you uh, look at, at populations that are larger and larger, they're collecting more and more information about uh, the joint distribution of, uh, of X and V. And uh, so they moved to the right here, but they could have moved to the right in a way that, that made them peel off of this sort of optimal curve. But what they found instead was that uh, it seemed to be tracking it within the error bars of their ability to estimate these quantities. Um, that's, that's the idea there. Um, does that make sense? Uh, I want to give you w another application of um, of these ideas, but it's not going to be biological. So um, let me pause for a second and see if questions about. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, x x in this case, if I make it capital, yeah, it would be the the tuple of x and y. Um, does that make sense? Uh, at at some time t, and y would be x and y at so some time t plus delta t. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the The, the next application I wanted to just briefly tell you about, this is very controversial. This is done in the past year. It's gotten a lot of attention. There's Quanta magazine articles written about it um, that you might have seen. Um, and this is an application that's dear to my heart. A lot of my, my own research right now is in machine learning. And people have been trying to understand these complicated uh, models called deep neural networks. And we don't really understand how they work. I have my own ideas about renormalization group. Um, uh, Tishby, who's one of the, the guys that invented the information bottleneck, has his own idea that uh, the information bottleneck could be relevant for understanding uh, deep neural networks. So I wanted to briefly just mention what, what he thinks is going on. So the idea in In this area of neural networks, just for simplicity, imagine you have a model that takes images at its input, and then it, it, in some ways that we don't have to worry about, computes some functions that are sort of nonlinear transformations that happen multiple times, and then in the end makes a prediction of what's in the image. So at, at this end here, the, you have an input x, and you have an output y. Um, and so in this case, x would be something like an image. And y is what, in machine learning, you would call a label, uh, the identity of an object in the image or something like that. And what Tishby wanted to think about was uh, 
intermediate layers of this network being like like T's, like compressed representations, and thinking about how much how much information does an intermediate layer in the neural network have about the input image versus how much does it have about the label? And not just what does that look like as you move through the, 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 the network. So these, these, ne these models these days have dozens to hundreds of layers. So it, it's not just two layers. There are many, many different layers that you, that you could look at. Um, but what does it actually look like during, during training? So um, you know, if, if someone hands you a neural network, it has all these parameters that, uh, that define the nonlinear transformations at each stage. And you want to improve those. Uh, essentially by taking the gradient of, of, of your error uh, with respect to those parameters and, and doing a better and better job. And you look at how does, you, how does, how does, uh, how do, how does your representation change as you're learning, as, as your model is getting better at performing. And what he found was that if you look in this information plane again, um, and you have a problem that has some boundary that certainly can't ever go down. Um, what he found is that if you look at, say, some layer here, it starts out, maybe it's close to the input. So even with some sort of random parameters here in this, in this transformation, you have a fair amount of information uh, about, the, uh, about the input. And as you learn, uh, as you learn, you acquire maybe a little bit more information about the input, but in particular, you're going up. So you're learning information about the label. You're acquiring information about the label. So he sees a phase that looks like this, and that takes a long time. And then it starts to turn around, and it seems to go back like this, and then sit here. Um, so, uh, and different, different layers do this in slightly different ways. Um, but the idea is that uh, is twofold. First of all, that for the systems that he was studying, he seemed to, to find two different regimes of, of learning. One was the sort of improvement and performance phase, and one was a compression phase. Um, so going left here is saying, get rid of stuff that was not that useful for me. And if I go up a little bit in that process even, that's better, because then I'm actually getting more information about, about the label. Um, so this, this delineation of learning in, the, in neural networks uh, as having two distinct phases, one of them being a, a compression phase, uh, a big deal was, was made of this. Secondly, um, where you land uh, for the different layers seems to be fairly close to this optimal information bottleneck curve that uh, he can compute. And it's, it's worth emphasizing that these neural networks were not, uh, were not trained to optimize the information bottleneck objective. They were optimized using stochastic gradient descent on an error function using backpropagation or whatever, uh, whatever TensorFlow uh, you know, has built in. Um, but nonetheless, they seemed to be uh, you know, quasi-optimizing this information bottleneck objective anyway. Um, so so they were using information model like as a lens uh, on neural networks, not as an objective function for training them. Um, and they found that it seemed to be uh, doing something sensible uh, from the information model like point of view anyway. Does that make sense? Mm hmm Possible, yeah. Um, I should say that, that these results are very controversial. Um, on up, there are subsequent papers that came out saying that they don't hold in other situations, and it's, it's very complicated. I don't know what's going on. Um, I just thought I would mention it because it's, uh, it's an exciting uh, topic, uh, and it sort of shows you 
you know where we are with something like uh, like neural networks, we really don't understand how they work. And if you have an idea, you can try it out and try to get a new perspective. Uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there that is that is pretty exciting. Um, and and for me personally, um, I like to think of uh, of these neural networks almost like little biological organisms that we want to understand. Um, but in some ways, it's a better situation uh, than than a neural network in your brain. Uh, it, the the neurons in your brain, um, they're very very hard to uh, hard to record from. Uh, it takes a, l a lot of work. Um, the data is noisy. Um, if you want to know how they're connected, there's a whole field of what's called connectomics right now, where people are trying to image uh, all of the connections between neurons, but it's almost impossible to know the strength of those connections, for example. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a ton of work. Uh, but people are working really, really hard to collect lots and lots of data on what neurons are doing and how they're connected. Um, but in some sense, we don't know what we're going to do with that information. Because if you take one of these networks in, in artificial intelligence that does some amazing thing and we don't understand how it works, we nonetheless have the exact connectivity between all of the nodes because we put it in and we can look at it uh, you know, in whatever way we want. And we can we can measure the the activity of all of the all of the units because we can monitor them as they're doing stuff. So we have like like a dream data set if this were a neuroscience thing. We we have every neuron recorded. We have every co every connection measured, and we still don't know how they work. So it seems like if we're going to spend billions of dollars as a, as you know collectively as humanity trying to collect this kind of data, we should probably understand what we want to do with it. And this is a good test bed for starting out. You know, trying to see, uh, you know, what what aspects of uh, of connectivity or activity do I need to answer certain kinds of questions? So um, that's why I'm excited about different different ways of understanding how these kinds of uh, of models work. Um, I had one more thing I wanted to tell you about, uh, but it's uh, going to be a bit of a not much, but a bit of a left turn. So let me pause again and see if there are any more questions. Okay, um, so the last thing I wanted to ju just briefly mention, um, like I've been doing uh, in each lecture, is to tell you something that I did uh, related to this. Uh, so um, I wrote a paper uh, with a PhD student at Princeton. I can't remember what year this was either last year or the year before. Um, and w what we did is, is called the, de the deterministic information bottleneck. So I want to go back to this uh, IB objective of information that x has about t minus information that t has about y. And I want to rewrite this information in one of the, th the many ways that we had. We have, have h of t minus h of t given x. OK. Um, so. And remember, we're, tr we're trying to minimize this quantity. Um, and this is one of the ways of writing information. This information that we're trying to minimize has two terms. One is just the entropy of the, of the compression, and one is the conditional entropy, given x. And if I'm trying to minimize this, and there's a minus sign here, that tells me that I'm trying to maximize, in some sense, this conditional entropy. And that kind of feels weird. Uh, if I'm trying to make a, com a compression, uh, make a T that is efficient, why should I be asking it to be noisy? Why should I be encouraging it to have entropy left over once I condition on X? It seems like a weird thing to do. Um, so what we wanted to do was say, get rid of this and uh, solve a problem instead where we just minimize the entropy of the compression while keeping information about the relevant thing. And that's, that makes sense because 
uh, as I said in the beginning, entropy is a measure of the sort of size or, or cost of coding uh, a distribution. So if we make the entropy as small as possible while still having information, that seems like a good trade-off between how expensive it is to do what I'm doing and, and having good performance. There are a couple problems here. Um, if you have a bare entropy um, uh, like this, and you think about uh, the entropy of a, of a continuous variable, where instead of doing sum of px log px, you do integral of px log px, you can have a, an, a bare entropy that's negative. Um, and this is a problem for various reasons. You address this in physics in certain ways. Um, here, this would, this would make the problem pathological, because then you're trying to minimize this. You would just send, send this to being a delta function, um, and you would get a non-interesting answer. So the first thing is that if you want to do this, you have to work with discrete t's only. So it has to be like a clustering instead of a, an encoding. So OK, we do that. Um, the other thing is uh, solving this is actually not feasible. So what we do is we put, a, we put an alpha here. Uh, we solve the problem as a function of alpha. Then we, then we take the limit as alpha goes to 0 at the end. And we see that uh, our, our map q of t given x, which is normally a stochastic map, uh, collapses to a function in that limit. That's a, just a technical aspect of solving it. Um, I just wanted to mention it uh, to sort of bring up that um, you know, these kinds of, of trade-offs between uh, performance and cost uh, are not gospel. They're something that you know, are worth thinking about. Uh, maybe, maybe, you, maybe there's a better idea for any particular situation for what, uh, what this should be. Maybe instead of information you want, maybe you know I want performance in some way and I really want to optimize performance subject to some cost and the cost should be something else also. So um, this, this sort of generally uh, you know, captures this, this sort of optimi optimization idea that I was talking about in the beginning of having uh, things that you want and things that are costly and finding some way of trading them off and uh, being skeptical and thinking about different <coughs> things that you can put here and different things that you can put here um, is, I think, in general, a, a fruitful uh, endeavor. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. And uh, let's see if you guys have any more questions. Oh, we have time for questions. Could you repeat again the last thing you said when you introduced the alpha? Yeah, um, if, if you just try to solve this problem um, and you go through the, the algebra that, uh, that I skipped on the board, uh, you find that you actually can't do it. Um, I don't know if it's not well posed or just I need to find another way to do it, but we certainly couldn't do it. So instead what we did was we, we put a, a parameter here and then we solved this sort of more general class of function uh, of problems with, with a, a parameter here and a parameter here. And then we just take the limit as this parameter goes to zero at the end and uh, we get what we want. But uh, yeah, I think it's probably just a technical thing. I think the, the limit as this approaches zero solution is the same as the alpha equals zero solution. I don't think that there's something funny going on, uh, but just practically, that's what we had to do. So if you look at the paper, you'll see that we did that. Thank you. More questions? I, I don't, I quite see why you call that mutual information between Y and T, like the performance, because you want your reduced dimensional distribution or something to be, to contain the more information of the label that you want to predict. Exactly. But why, do, why do you call the other mutual information cost? I mean, why is it? Um, so uh, it's, it's supposed to represent uh, a cost in the original information bottleneck. Um, the idea was that um, representing bits is expensive, 
maybe. Uh, it means my, my si size of my, of my representation has to be big. Maybe there's a, there's a communication channel from the input to me that has to be big. So, so finding a way to reduce that mutual information should be useful. Um, I agree with you that it's not that intuitively obvious that that mutual information represents a cost. To me, I also wrote this paper, but to me, the entropy of the compression seems like a more natural way of, of encoding the cost uh, of, of a representation because it tells you how big it has to be. Uh, it, it does have this not nice property that this bare entropy uh, means that you can only work with discrete t's. And if you want to work with continuous t's, then using information is better. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's another aspect of it, which is maybe more theoretical, which is that mutual information is, is reparameterization invariant, uh, and the entropy is not. So uh, there's some nice properties of, about only working with informations, but maybe those are more, more abstract. Anyone else? So oh, then let's thank David again. <laughs> and we'll be back after lunch.